When I wrote Dear Brutus, as with many of my plays, I drew on some of my own experiences. And the listener, in the course of being, I hope, rarely entertained, can also amuse themselves in deciding which events are taken from my own life, and which are necessarily a matter of invention. We are in Lobb's house, in an unlit room, looking out to the garden which is bathed in moonlight. Behind us is the door to the dining room, where his house guests are assembled. The door opens, and several shadows appear in the lighted doorway, and hesitate on the two steps that lead down into the unlit room. They are Lobb's lady house guests. Go on, Cody. Lead the way. Oh dear, I don't see why I should go first. The nicest always goes first. It is a strange house if I am the nicest. It is a strange house. Don't close the door. I can't see where the switch is. Over here. We must not waste a second. Our minds are made up, I think. Now is the time. Yes, now if at all. But should we? Certainly, before the men come in. You don't think we should wait for the men? They're as much in it as we are. Lob would be with them. If the thing is to be done at all, it should be done now. Is it quite fair to Lob? After all, he is our host. Of course it isn't fair to him. But let's do it, Cody. Yes, let's do it. Mrs. Dearth is doing it. Of course I am. The men are not coming, are they? No. Your husband is having another glass of port. I am sure he is. Uh, One of you ring, please. Poor matey. He richly deserves what he is about to get. He is coming. Don't all stand huddled together like conspirators. It is what we are. Ah, matey. I wish this telegram sent. Very good, ma'am. Village post office closed at eight. But but if your message is important... It is. And you are so clever, matey. I'm sure that you can persuade them to oblige you. (laughs) I'll see to it myself, ma'am. You can depend on its going. Thank you. Oh, better read the telegram, matey, to be sure that you can make it out. Read it aloud, matey. Oh, Mum. Aloud. <sighs> to police station, great company. Send officer first thing tomorrow morning to arrest matey, butler, for theft of rings. Yes, that is quite right. Mum. My lady. Should we not say how many rings? Yes. Put in the number of rings, matey. Now I have returned the rings, may I tear up the telegram, ma'am? Certainly not. I always said that this man was the culprit. I am never mistaken in faces, and I see broad arrows all over yours, matey. It is deeply regretted. I am sure it is. We may as well tell him now that it is not our rings we are worrying about. They have just been a means to an end, matey. Right? Precisely. In other words, that telegram is sent unless... Unless you can tell us instantly what peculiarity it is that all we ladies have in common. Not only the ladies, all the guests in this house. We have been here a week, and we find that when Lob invited us, he knew us all so little that we begin to wonder why he asked us. And now, from words he has let drop, we know that we were invited because of something he thinks we have in common. But he won't say what it is. One knows that no people could be more unlike. One does. And we can't sleep at night, matey, for wondering what this something is. But we are sure you know... And if you don't tell us, quad. I don't know what you mean, ladies. Oh, yes, you do. You must admit that your master is a very strange person. He is a little odd, ma'am. That's why everyone calls him Lob, not Mr. Lob. He is so odd. Ugh, I fear that we have been invited here for some sort of horrid experiment. You look as if you thought so too. Oh, oh, no, miss. I, uh, he... uh, You shouldn't have come, ladies. You didn't ought to have come. Now, my man, what do you mean by that? Nothing, my lady. I I just mean, why did you come if you are the kind he thinks? The kind he thinks? What kind does he think? Well, now we are getting at it. I haven't a notion, ma'am. Then it is not necessarily our virtue that makes Lob interested in us. (laughs) No, my lady. Oh, no, my lady. 
and yet you know he is rather lovable. He is, ma'am. He's the most lovable old devil. Oh, I beg pardon, ma'am. Oh, you scarcely need to, for in a way it is true. I have seen him out there among his flowers, petting them, talking to them, coaxing them till they simply had to grow. It certainly is a divine garden. How lovely it is in the moonlight. Roses, roses all the way. Oh, it's like a hat I once had when I was young. Lob is such an amazing gardener that I believe he could even grow hats. He is a wonderful gardener, but is that quite nice at his age? What is his age, man? I won't tell, my lady. I think he's frightened that the police would step in if they knew how old he is. They do say in the village that they remember him 70 years ago, looking just as he does today. Absurd. Yes, ma'am. But there are his razors. Razors? You won't know about razors, my lady. Not being married. Oh. <laughs> As yet, excuse me. But a married lady can tell a man's age by the number of his razors. If you saw his razors, there's a little world of them. From patents at a present day, back to implements so horrible. You can picture them with him, in his hands, scraping his way through the ages. <laughs> You amuse one to an extent. Uh, Was he ever married? He's quite forgotten, my lady. How long ago is it since Merry England? Why do you ask? In Queen Elizabeth's time, wasn't it? He says that he's all that's left of Merry England, that little man. Lob? I think there's a famous cricketer called Lob. Wasn't there a Lob in Shakespeare? No, of course. I'm thinking of Robin Goodfellow. The names are so alike. (laughs) Robin Goodfellow was Puck. That is what was in my head. Lob was another name for Puck. Well, he is rather like what Puck might have grown into if he had forgotten to die. And by the way, I remember now, he does call his flowers by the old Elizabethan names. He always calls the nightingale Philomel, miss, if that's any help. None whatever. Tell me this, did he specially ask you all for Midsummer Week? He would. Now what do you mean? He always likes him to be here on Midsummer Night, ma'am. Them? Whom? Them who have that in common. What can it be? I don't know. I hope we're all nice women. We don't know each other very well. Does anything startling happen at those times? I don't know. Why, I believe this is Midsummer Eve. Yes, miss, it is. The villagers know it. They're all inside their houses tonight, with doors barred. Because of... Of him? He frightens them. There are stories. What alarms them? Tell us, or this telegram... I know nothing for certain, ma'am. I've never done it myself. He has wanted me to, but I wouldn't. Done what? Ma'am, don't ask me. Be merciful to me, ma'am. I'm I'm not bad, naturally. It was just going into domestic service that did it for me. The accident of being flung among bad companions... It's touch and go how the poor turn out in this world. All depends on you taking the right or wrong turning. I dare say that is true. When I was young, ma'am, I was offered a clerkship in the city. If I'd have taken that, there wouldn't be a more honest man alive today. I would give the world to be able to begin over again. It is very sad, Mrs Durth. I am sorry for him, but still... What do you say, my lady? As you ask me, I should certainly say jail. (laughs) If you will say no more about this, ma'am, I'll give you a tip that's worth it. Ah, now you are talking. Don't listen to him. You are the one that's hardest on me. Yes, I flatter myself that I am. You might take the wrong turn in yourself, my lady. I? How dare you, man? The men are rising. Very well, matey, we agree. If the tip is good enough... Uh, You will regret this. I think not, my lady. It's this. I wouldn't go out tonight if he asked you. Go into the garden if you like. Garden's all right. I wouldn't go further. Not tonight. But he never proposes to us to go further. Why should he tonight? I don't know, ma'am, but don't any of you go. Except you, my lady. I should like you to go. Me? Oh, my word. (laughs) Shall I destroy the telegram? (laughs) Thank you, ma'am. You should have sent that telegram off. You are sure you have told us all you know, matey? Yes, miss. Above all, ladies. I wouldn't go into the wood. The wood? 
Why, there's no wood within a dozen miles of here. Uh, no, ma'am, but all the same. I wouldn't go into it, ladies. Not if I were you. On his way back to the dining room, Matey passes Lop, a tiny man with a domed head. <laughs> Standing day, lady. <laughs> Pray be seated. And as Mrs. Colt sits, Lob pretends to pull away the chair. <laughs> you naughty. <laughs> it is quite a flirtation, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, with that, he happily sinks into a chair. Is my husband still sampling the port, Mr. Purdy? Do you know, I believe he is. Do the ladies like our proposal, Cody? I haven't told them of it yet. Uh, the fact is, I'm afraid that it might tire my wife too much. Uh, do you feel equal to a little exertion tonight, Cody? Or is your foot troubling you? I have been resting it, Cody. Uh, there. Uh, is that more comfortable? Presently, dear, if you're agreeable, we're all going out for a walk. Well, the garden is all right. Ah, but it is not to be the garden. We are going farther afield. We have an adventure for tonight. Get thick shoes and a wrap, Mrs. Dearth. All of you. Where do you propose to take us? To find a mysterious wood. Are you being funny, Mr. Purdy? <laughs> well, you know quite well there are not any trees for miles around. You have said yourself that it is the one blot on the landscape. Ah, mm. on ordinary occasions. But allow us to point out to you, Miss Joanna, that this is Midsummer Eve. Tell them what you told us, Lob. It, it is all nonsense, of course. Just foolish talk of the villagers. They say that on Midsummer's Eve there is a strange wood in this part of the country. Where? Ah, that is one of its most charming features. It is never twice in the same place, apparently. It has been seen on different parts of the Downs and on Moor Common. Once it was close to Radley Village and another time about a mile from the sea. <laughs> oh, a sporting wood. And Lob is anxious that we should all go and look for it. Uh, not he. Uh, Lob is the only sceptic in the house. Says it's all rubbish and we all shall be sillies if we go. Uh, but we believe that, eh, Purdy? Rather. Just wasted the evening. <laughs> Let us have a round game of cards here instead. No, sir. I am going to find that wood. What is the good of it when it is found? Well, we shall wander in it deliciously, listening to a new sort of bird called the philomel. Yes, yes. <laughs> shall we keep together, Mr. Purdy? Uh, no, we, we must hunt in pairs. Well, I think it would be rather fun. <laughs> oh, come on, Cody, I'll lace your boots for you. I'm sure your poor foot will carry you nicely. Uh, Miss Trout, uh, wait a moment. Lob, has this wonderful wood any special properties? No, there's no wood. You've never seen it? Not I. I don't believe in it. Have any of the villagers ever been in it? So it is said. So it is said. Well, what did they say were their experiences? Uh, that isn't known. They never came back. <gasps> never came back. Absurd, of course. You see, in the morning, the wood was gone. And so they were gone too. <laughs> yes, yes. I don't think I like this wood. It certainly is Midsummer Eve. Of course. If, if you ladies are against it, we'll drop the idea. It was only a bit of fun. Yes. Better give it up to please Lob. Oh, all right, Lob. What about that round game of cards? I wanted you to go. I set my heart on you going. It is the thing that I wanted. And it isn't good for me not to get the thing that I wanted. Oh, good gracious. He has wanted it all the time. You wicked love. Now, you see, there is something in it. Uh, nonsense, Mrs. Death. It was only a joke. Oh, don't cry, Lobby. Nobody cares for me. Nobody loves me, and I need to be loved. Yes, we do. We all love you. Nice, nice, Lobby. <laughs> Dear Lob, I am so fond of you. Dry his eyes with my own handkerchief. Don't pamper him. I need to be pampered. You funny little man. Let us go at once and look for his wood. Boots and cloaks, hats forward. Oh, come on, Lady Caroline, just to show you're not afraid of matey. Lob is alone. 
and crawls out from under the table. <laughs> oh, my dear flowers. Poor bruised one. It was I who hurt you. Lob is so sorry. Lie there. Pretty, pretty. Let me see where you have pain. You fell on your head. It is the place. Now I make better. <laughs> oh, little rascal. <laughs> You're not hurt at all. <laughs> you just pretend. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> Sweetheart, don't cry. You are now prettier than ever. You were too tall. <laughs> oh, how beautifully you smell now that you were small. <laughs> drink, drink. Now you are happy again. Oh, the little rascal smiles. <laughs> All smile, please. <laughs> Not heads. Aha! <laughs> you love Lob. Lob loves you. What were you saying to the flowers, Lob? I was saying two's company, three's none. <gasps> that man, <laughs> he suspects. But no one minds Lob. My dear. Oh, my dear. Yes, but he saw you kiss my hand. Jack, if Mabel were to suspect... There is nothing for her to suspect. No, there isn't, is there? Jack, I am not doing anything wrong, am I? No, you. Mabel is your wife, Jack. I should so hate myself if I did anything that was disloyal to her. Those eyes could never be disloyal. My lady of the nut-brown eyes, oh, the sveltness of you. Joanna, why are you so svelte? All I want is to help her, and you. I know how well I know, my dear, brave love. I am very fond of Mabel, Jack. I should like to be the best friend she has in the world. You are, dearest. No woman ever had a better friend. And yet, I don't think she really likes me. I wonder why. It is just that Mabel doesn't understand... Nothing can make me say a word against my wife. I wouldn't listen to you if you did. And I love you all the more, dear, for saying that. But Mabel is a cold nature, and she doesn't understand. She doesn't appreciate your finer qualities. Mm, that's it. But of course, I am difficult. I always was a strange, strange creature. I often think, Joanna, that I am rather like a flower that has never had the sun to shine on it, nor the rain to water it. Oh, you break my heart. I suppose there is no more lonely man than I walking the earth today. It is so mournful. It is the thought of you that sustains me, elevates me. You shine high above me like a star. No, no. Oh, I wish I was wonderful, but I am not. You have made me a better man, Joanna. I am so proud to think that. You've made me kinder to Mabel. I'm sure you were always kind to her. Yes, I hope so. But I think now of special little ways of giving her pleasure. That never-to-be-forgotten day when we first met, you and I. That tragic, lovely day by the weir. Oh, Jack! Do you know how in gratitude I spent the rest of that day? Tell me. I read to Mabel, aloud, for an hour. I did it out of kindness to her, because I had met you. It was dear of you. Do you remember that first time, my arms, your waist... You are so fluid, Joanna. Why are you so fluid? I can't help it, Jack. I gave her a ruby bracelet for that. It is a gem. You have given that lucky woman many lovely things. It is my invariable custom to go straight off and buy Mabel something whenever you have been sympathetic to me. Those new earrings of hers, they are in memory of the first day you called me Jack. Her Paquin gown, uh, the one with the beads, was because you let me kiss you. I didn't exactly let you. <laughs> no, but you have such a dear way of giving in. Jack, she hasn't worn that gown of late. No, nor the jewels. I think she has some sort of idea now that when I give her anything nice, it means that you would be nice to me. She has rather a suspicious nature, Mabel. She never used to have it, but it seems to be growing on her. I wonder why. I wonder why. <gasps> Was that anyone in the garden? Uh, there's no one there now. I'm sure I heard someone. If it was Mabel. Jack, if she saw us, she would think you were kissing me. I'm so sorry to uh, interrupt you, Jack. <sighs> but please wait a moment before you kiss her again. Excuse me, Joanna. <sighs> I did not want the others to see you. They might not understand how noble you are, Jack. 
You can go on now. How extraordinary. Of all the... Oh, but how contemptible. Mabel! Did you call me, Joanna? I insist on an explanation. What were you doing in the garden, Mabel? I was looking for something I have lost. Anything important? I used to fancy it, Jack. It is my husband's love. You don't happen to have picked it up, Joanna. (gasps) If so, and you don't set great store by it, I should like it back. The pieces, I mean. (laughs) Mabel, I, I will not be talked to in that way. To imply that I, that your husband... Oh, shame. I must say, Mabel, that I am a little disappointed in you. Hmm. I certainly understood that you had gone upstairs to put on your boots. (laughs) Poor old Jack. A woman like that. (laughs) I forgive you, Mabel. You will be sorry for this afterwards. Not a word against Joanna, Mabel. If you knew how nobly she has spoken of you. (laughs) She does know. She has been listening. Uh, This is a man's business. I must be open with you now, Mabel. It is the manlier way. If you wish it, I shall always be true to you in word and deed. It is your right. But I cannot pretend that Joanna is not the one woman in the world for me. If I had met her before you, it's kismet, I suppose. Oh, too late, too late. I suppose you never knew what true love was till you met her, Jack. You force me to say it. Joanna and I are as one person. We have not a thought at variance. We are one rather than two. (laughs) Yes, and that's the one. (laughs) I am so sorry to have marred your lives. If any blame there is, it is all mine. She is as spotless as the driven snow. The moment I mentioned love to her, she told me to desist. Not she. So you were listening. (laughs) Mabel, don't you see how splendid he is? (laughs) Not quite, Joanna. Oh, how lovely of you, Jack, to take it all upon yourself. It is the man's privilege. Mabel has such a horrid way of seeming to put people in the wrong. Have you noticed that? Poor Mabel, it is not an enviable quality. I don't think I care to go out now. She has spoilt it all. She has taken the innocence out of it, Jack. We must be brave and not mind her. Joanna, if we had met in time, if only I could begin again. To be battered forever just because I once took the wrong turning, it isn't fair. The wrong turning? Now... Who was saying that a moment ago, about himself? Why, it was Matey. Is that her coming back again? It's too bad. Ah, it is you, Mrs. Durth. Yes, it is. But thank you for telling me, Mr. Purdy. Oh, I don't intrude, do I? Why should you? Uh, Rather not. We were uh, (laughs) hoping it would be you. Mm. We want to start on the walk. I can't think of what has become of the others. We've been looking for them everywhere. Well, do go on looking. Under that flower pot would be a good place. It is my husband I am in search of. Shall I root him out for you? Oh, how too unutterably kind of you, Mr. Purdy. I hate to trouble you, but it would be the sort of service one never forgets. You know, I believe you are chafing me. No, no. I am incapable of that. (laughs) I won't be a moment. Miss Trout and I will await your return with ill-concealed impatience. Yes, I suppose you are right. I dare say I am. I didn't say anything. I thought I heard you say that hateful dearth woman coming butting in where she is not wanted. You certainly have good ears. Yes, they have always been rather admired. By the painters for whom you sat when you were an artist model? So that has leaked out, has it? I shouldn't have said that. Do you think I care whether you know or not? I'm sure you don't. Still, it was cattish of me. It was. I don't see it. I am uncommonly flattered, Alice, to hear that you have sent for me. It takes me quite aback. It isn't your company I want, Will. You know, I felt that Purdy must have delivered your message wrongly. I want you to come with us on this mysterious walk and keep an eye on Lob. On poor little Lob? Oh, surely not. I can't make the man out. I want you to tell me something. When he invited us here... Do you think it was you or me he specially wanted? Oh, you. He made no bones about it. He said there was something about you that made him want uncommonly to have you down here. Will, try to remember this. Did he ask us for any particular time? Yes, he was particular about it being midsummer week. Ah, I thought so. Did he say what it was about me that made him want me to be here for midsummer week? No, but I presumed it must be your fascination, Alice. Just so. 
Well, I want you to come out with us tonight to watch him. Cracking my eye, Tommy. Spy on my host. Such a harmless little chap, too. No. Excuse me, Alice. Besides, I have an engagement. An engagement? With the port decanter, I presume? Good guess, but wrong. The decanter is now but an empty shell. Still, how you know me. My engagement is with a quiet cigar in the garden. Your hand is so unsteady. You won't be able to light the match. Well, I shall just manage. A nice hand for an artist. One would scarcely call me an artist nowadays. Not so far as any work is concerned. Not so far as having any more pretty dreams to paint is concerned. (laughs) I wonder why I have become such a waster, Alice. I suppose it was always in you. I suppose so. And yet, I was rather a good sort in the days when I went courting you. Yes, I thought so. Unlucky days for me, as it has turned out. Yes, a bad job for you. I didn't know I was a wrong one at the time. I thought quite well of myself and thought a vast deal more of you. Cracking my eye, Tommy, how I used to leap out of bed at 6am, all agog to be at my easel. Blood ran through my veins in those days. And now, I'm middle-aged and done for. Funny, I don't know how it has come about, nor what has made the music mute. When did you begin to despise me, Alice? When I got to know you really well, a long time ago. Yes, I think that is true. It was a long time ago, and before I had begun to despise myself. It wasn't until I knew you had no opinion of me that I began to go downhill. You will grant that, won't you? And that I did try for a bit to fight on. If you had cared for me, I wouldn't have come to this, surely. Well, I found I didn't care for you, and I wasn't hypocrite enough to pretend I did. Oh, that's blunt. But you used to admire my bluntness. The bluntness of you, the adorable wildness of you, you untamed thing. There never were any shades in you. Kiss or kill was your motto, Alice. I felt, from the first moment I saw you, that you would love me or knife me. I didn't knife you. No. I suppose that was where you made the mistake. It is hard on you, old lady. And I suppose it's too late to try to patch things up. Let's be honest. It is too late, Will. Perhaps if we had had children. A pity. A blessing, I should think. Seeing what sort of a father they would have had. I dare say you're right. Well, Alice, I know that somehow it is my fault. And I'm sorry for you. I'm sorry for myself. Oh, if I hadn't married you, what a different woman I should be. Oh, what a fool I was. Ah, three things they say come not back to men or women. The spoken word, the past life, and the neglected opportunity. I wonder if we should make any more of them, Alice, if they did come back to us. You wouldn't. (coughs) Yes, I guess you're right. But I... Uh, Yes, yes. What a boon for you. But I hope it's not Freddy French Fellow you would put in my place. I know he is following you about again. He followed me about, as you put it, before I knew you. I don't know why I quarrelled with him. Your heart told you that he was no good, Alice. My heart told me that you were... So it wasn't much of a service to me, my heart. The Honourable Freddy French fellow is a gentleman thief and a rotter. <laughs> well, you are certainly an authority on the subject. Yes, you have me there. After which brief but pleasant little connubial chat, he pursued his dishonoured way into the garden. But as Darth is about to go through the French windows into the garden, the other guests return from the dining room. Here they are. Are you ready, dear lady? Are you not coming with us to find the wood, Mr. Durth? Yes, I am unavoidably detained. You will find me in the garden when you come back. If we do ever come back. Precisely. Should we never meet again, Alice? Very well. Bertie, Hmm? if you find the tree of knowledge in the wood, bring me back an apple. I promise. Come quickly. (laughs) Matey mustn't see me. Matey? What difference would that make, Glob? He would take me off to bed. It's past my time. 
You know, old fellow, you make it very difficult for us to embark on this adventure in the proper eerie spirit. Well, I'm for the garden. Dearth goes to leave by the front windows, begins to draw back the curtains, then stops. How now, Dearth? <gasps> what is it we get in the wood, Lop? Ah, he won't tell us that. Come on! Tell us first. <laughs> they say that in the wood you get what nearly everybody here is longing for. A second chance. <gasps> so that is what we have in common. I have often thought, Cody, that if I had a second chance, I should be a useful man instead of a nice, lazy one. A second chance. Come on! <laughs> yes, to the wood. The wood. There is now no moonlight, and the room is in darkness, save for the light from one lamp. He quietly walks away from the window and puts his cigar on the table. And as the guests start to leave... Stop! Why not go this way? He pulls apart the curtains. And where once they saw a garden, they see a still, sombre wood of blackness and moonshine. Anyone ready to risk it? Uh, of course, there is nothing in it. J- just... Of course. Going out, Purdy? A second chance. I shall be back in a moment. <laughs> he does not come back. It's horrible. And so Mrs. Cold goes back to her room. But her husband does not follow. And so, gradually, the guests are drawn as if by magnets into the wood. Mabel! Purdy's wife. You will have to go now, Mr. Purdy. Purdy and Joanna. That's enough! Don't you go, Mrs. Death. You'll catch it if you go. A second chance. Alice. One would like to know. Lady Caroline. Mr. Code, hearing but not heeding his wife's voice, calling from within the house. It's past your bedtime, sir. Say goodnight to the ladies and uh, come along. Matey! Look! Great heavens. Then it is true. Yes! But I... Well, I wasn't sure. (laughs) And finally, but inexorably... Matey enters the wood, leaving Lob standing alone, staring out upon the unknown. It is moonlight, and we are in the depths of Lob's Wood, the wood of the second chance. We see Matey and Lady Caroline as husband and wife. Is it not a lovely night, Jim? Listen, my own to Philomel. He is saying that he is lately married. (laughs) So are we, you ducky thing. I feel, Jim, that I am Rosalind and that you are my Orlando. What do you say I am, Caroline? Oh, my own one. Don't you think it would be fun if we were to write poems about each other and pin them on the tree trunks? Poems? I never knew such a lady for high-flown language. Your lady, dearest. Jim's lady. (laughs) And don't you forget it. And what would you do if I were to forget it? Great bear. I'll take a stick to you. I love to hear you talk like that. It is so virile. 
I always knew that it was a master I needed. <laughs> it's what you all need. Oh, it is. It is, you knowing wretch. Listen, Caroline. This is what gets the ladies. How much have you made this week, you wonderful man? Another 200 or so. That's all, just 200 or so. Oh, my dear golden ring. Listen to him. Kiss my golden fetter, Jim. Wait till I light this cigar. Let me hold the darling match. Ah, tidy looking petite corona this. <laughs> there was a time when one of this sort would have run away with two days of my screw. How I should have loved Jim to know you when you were poor. Fancy your having once been a clerk. <laughs> well, we all have our beginnings. But it wouldn't have mattered how I began, Caroline. I should have come to the top just the same. I'm a climber, and there are nails in my boots for the parties beneath me. Ah, boots! <laughs> I tell you, if I'd been a bootmaker, I should have been the best bootmaker in London. I am sure you would, Jim. But should you have made the very best boots? <laughs> <laughs> very good, Caroline. That is the wittiest thing I've heard you say. But it's late. We should be strolling back to our Rolls Royce. Oh, I do hope the ground wasn't damp. <laughs> Doesn't matter if it was. I was lying on your rug. Huh. Who's this mournful party? Joanna reaches the glade and is as unknown to them as they are to her. I uh, wonder, sir, whether you happen to have seen my husband. I have lost him in the wood. Uh, we're strange these parts ourselves, missus. Have we passed anyone, Caroline? Oh, should we have noticed, darling? Oh, might it be that old gent over there? Oh, no. My husband is quite young. Seems a merry old cock. Evening to you, sir. Do you happen to have seen a young gentleman in the wood lately? All by himself and looking for his wife? I can't say that I have. He uh, isn't necessarily by himself. And I don't know that he is looking for me. There may be a young lady with him. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Oh, ho! Oh. Is that what you would prefer? Now, 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 Caroline, your manners. Uh, would he be singing or, or dancing? Oh, no. At least, I hope not. Hope not? Odd. If he's doing neither, then I'm not likely to notice him. But if I do, what name shall I say? Purdy. I am Mrs. Purdy. Ah, I will try to keep a lookout. And if I see him... Uh, but I'm rather occupied at present. I'm sorry I troubled you. I see him now. Is he alone? Ah, I see from your face that he isn't. Caroline, no awkward questions. Evening, Mrs. I hope you to get him to go along with you quietly. <laughs> Watch the old codger dancing. And with that, matey and lady Caroline dance after the old codger. Joanna waits behind a tree as Purdy, dressed in knickerbockers, chases a young Mabel from tree to tree. Jack? <laughs> Mabel? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I don't know you nearly well enough for that. Besides, what would your wife say? I should begin to think that you're a very dreadful man, Mr. Purdy. Surely you might call me Jack after all this time. <laughs> Perhaps. If you're very good, Jack. <laughs> if only Joanna were more like you. <laughs> like me? You mean her face? <laughs> it is a, well, if it is not precisely pretty, it is a good face. <laughs> I don't mind her face at all. I am glad you have got such a dependable little wife, Jack. <laughs> Thanks. What would Joanna have said if she'd seen you just now? Your wife should be incapable of jealousy. Joanna? Jealous? But has she any reason? Uh, Jack, tell me, who is the woman? Shall I, Mabel? Shall I? I can't think who she is. Have I ever seen her? Every time you look in a mirror. How odd, Jack. That can't be. When I look in a mirror, I see only myself. <laughs> How adorably innocent you are, Mabel. Joanna would have guessed at once. <laughs> not that. Shall I tell you now? I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, Jack... I try not to say it, but if you feel you must, say it in such a way that it would not hurt the feelings of Joanna if she happened to be passing by, as she nearly always is. I would rather not say it at all than that way. I don't know, Mabel, whether you have noticed that I am not like other men. All my life I have been a soul that has had to walk alone. Even as a child I had no hope that it would be otherwise. I distinctly remember when I was six, thinking how unlike other children I was... Before I was twelve, I suffered from terrible self-deprecation. I do so still. 
I suppose there never was a man who had a more lowly opinion of himself. Jack, are you who are so universally admired? That doesn't help. I remain my own judge. I am afraid I am a dark spirit, Mabel. Yes, yes, my dear, let me leave nothing untold, however it may damage me in your eyes. Your eyes. I cannot remember a time when I did not think of love as a great consuming passion. I visualized it, Mabel, as perhaps few have done, but always as the abounding joy that could come to others, but never to me. I expected too much of women. I suppose I was touched to finer issues than most. That has been my tragedy. Then you met Joanna. Then I met Joanna. Yes, foolishly as I now see. I thought she would understand that I was far too deep a nature, really, to mean the little things I sometimes said to her. Mm -hmm. I suppose a man was never placed in such a position before. <sighs> what was I to do? Remember, I was always certain that the ideal love could never come to me. Whatever the circumstances, I was convinced that my soul must walk alone. Oh, Joanna, how could you? No, not a word against her, Mabel. If blame there is, the blame is mine. And so you married her? And so I married her. Out of pity? I felt it was a man's part. I was such a child in worldly matters that it was pleasant to me to have the right to pay a woman's bills. I enjoyed seeing her garments lying about on my chairs. In time, that exultation wore off. But I was not unhappy. I didn't expect much. I was always so sure that no woman could ever plumb the well of my emotions. Then you met me. <laughs> then I met you. Too late. Never. Forever. Forever. Never. They're the saddest words in the English tongue. At the time, I thought a still sadder word was Joanna. Oh, no. What was it you saw in me that made you love me? I think it was the feeling that you are so like myself. Have you noticed that, Jack? Sometimes it has almost terrified we me. We think the same thoughts. We are not two, Mabel. We are we are one. Your hair... Oh, Joanna knows you admire it. And for a week she did hers in the same way. I never noticed. That was why she gave it up. And it didn't really suit her. I can't think of a good way of doing dear Joanna's hair. What's that you're muttering to yourself, Jack? I, I uh, don't keep anything from me. I was repeating a poem I've written. It is in two words. Mabel Purdy. May I teach it to you, sweet? Say, <laughs> say Mabel Purdy to me. If I were to say it, Jack, I should be false to Joanna. Never ask me to be that. Let us go on. Say it, Mabel, say it. See, I write it on the ground with your sunshade. If it could be... Jack, I'll whisper it to you. They wander farther into the forest, and the bedraggled figure of Joanna follows them. The nightingale sings not for them, but for a father and daughter, who are racing each other to find the spot where, last night, they put up their easel. Boom, 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 Daddy! Daddy, I have won! Here is the place! Cracking my eye, Tommy! Yes, that is the tree I stuck my easel under last night. And behold the blessed moon, behaving more gorgeously than ever. <laughs> I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, old moon, but you ought to know by now how time passed. Now, keep still while I hand you down to posterity. The moon is looking rather pale tonight, isn't she? Comes of keeping late hours. Uh, Daddy, watch me. Look at me. Please, sweet moon, a pleasant expression. No, no, not as if you were sitting for it. That is too professional. <laughs> that is better, thank you. Now, keep it. That is the sort of thing you say to them, Dad. I oughtn't to have brought you out so late. You should be tucked up in your cosy bed. Huh? <laughs> With a pillow, anyhow. Except in the proper place. And the sheet over my face. Where it oughtn't to be. And Daddy tiptoeing in to take it off. Which is more than you deserve. Then why does he stand so long at the door? And before she has gone, she bursts out laughing, for she has been awake the whole time. That's about it. What a life. But I oughtn't to have brought you here. Best to have the sheet over you when the moon's about. Moonlight is bad for little daughters. I can't sleep when the moon is full. She keeps calling to me to get up. Perhaps I am her daughter too. Well, Gad, you look it tonight. Do I? Then can't you paint me into the picture as well as Mama? <laughs> you could call it a mother and daughter. Or simply two ladies, if the moon thinks that calling me her daughter would make her seem too old. <laughs> oh, matre pulcra filia pulcria. Now that 
means oh moon, more beautiful than any tuppenny halfpenny daughter. Daddy, mm-hmm. do you really prefer her? <laughs> She's not a patch on you. It's the sort of thing we say to our sitters to keep them in good humour. I wish to heaven, Margaret, we were not both so fond of apple tart. <laughs> and what is this? It's a tear. I should think it is a tear. That boy at the farm did it. He kept calling snubs after me, but I got down and kicked him in the stomach. <laughs> he is rather a jolly boy. Ooh, he sounds it. Ye gods, what a night. And what a moon. Dad... She's not quite so fine as that. Shh. Yes, she is. <laughs> Dad, Dad, what a funny man. <laughs> Hold me tight, Daddy. I'm frightened. I think they want to take you away from me. Who, Gosling? I don't know. It's too lovely, Daddy. I won't be able to keep hold of it. What is? The world. Everything. And you, Daddy, most of all. Things that are too beautiful can't last. Now, how did you find that out? I don't know. Daddy, am I sometimes stranger than other people's daughters? More of a madcap, perhaps. Do you think I am sometimes too full of gladness? My sweetheart, you do sometimes run over with it. (laughs) (laughs) To be very gay, dearest dear, is so near to being very sad. How did you find that out, child? I don't know. From something in me that's afraid. Daddy... What is a might have been? A might have been? They are ghosts, Margaret. I I dare say I might have been a great swell of a painter. Instead of just this uncommonly happy nobody. Or again, I might have been a worthless, idle waster of a fellow. You? (laughs) Who knows? Some little kink in me might have set me off on the wrong road. And that poor soul I might so easily have been might have had no Margaret. My word, I'm sorry for him. Oh, so am I. Ah. The poor old daddy, wandering about the world without me. And there are other might-have-beens. Lovely ones, but intangible. Shades, Margaret, made of sad folks' thoughts. I'm so glad I am not a shade. Mm. How awful it would be, Daddy, to wake up and find one wasn't alive. It would, dear. Daddy, wouldn't it be awful? I think men need daughters. They do. Especially artists. Yes, especially artists. Especially artists. Especially artists. (laughs) Fame is not everything. Fame is rot. Daughters are the thing. Daughters are the thing. Daughters are the thing. (laughs) I wonder if sons would be even nicer. Not a patch on daughters. The awful thing about a son is that never, well, never at least from the day he goes to school, can you tell him that you rather like him? By the time he is ten, you can't even take him on your knee. <laughs> Sons are not worth having, Margaret. Signed, W. Duff. But if you were a mother, Dad, I dare say he would let you do it. You think so? I mean, when no one was looking. Sons are not so bad. Signed, M. Duff. But I'm glad you prefer daughters. At what age are we the nicest, Daddy? <laughs> Hi, Daddy. At what age are we the nicest? <laughs> Daddy! Hi! <laughs> Hi! At what age are we the nicest? Eh? Ah, oh, yes, that's a poser. Now, I think you were nicest when you were two and knew your alphabet up to G but fell over at eight. No, 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 you were best when you were half past three. <laughs> or, or just, just before you struck six. Or in the mumps year when I asked you in the early morning how you were and you said solemnly, I haven't tried yet. Did I? Such was your answer. But I'm not sure that chickenpox doesn't beat mumps. Oh, Lord, I'm all wrong. The nicest time in a father's life is the year before she puts up her hair. I suppose that is a splendid time. But there's a nicer year coming to you. Daddy, there's a nicer year coming to you. Is the done? Daddy, the year she does put up her hair. Puts it up? Forever? You know, I am afraid that when that day comes, I shan't be able to stand it. It'll be too exciting. My poor heart, Margaret. No, no, it will be lucky for you. For it isn't to be a bit like that. I am to be a girl and woman, day about, for the first year. You will never know which I am till you look at my hair. And even then you won't know. For if it's down, I will put it up. And if it is up, I shall put it down. And so my daddy will gradually get used to the idea. I see you have been thinking it out. I've been doing more than that. Shut your eyes, Dad. I shall give you a glimpse of the future. I don't know that I want that. The present is so good. Shut your eyes, please. No, Margaret. Oh, please, Daddy. Oh, all right. They're shut. Don't open them till I tell you. 
What finger is that? The dirty one. Oh. Daddy, now I'm putting up my hair. I've got such a darling of a mirror. It is such a darling mirror I've got, Dad. Dad, don't look. I shall tell you about it. Mm. It is a little pool of water. I wish we could take it home and hang it up. Of course, the moment my hair is up, there will be other changes also. For instance, I shall talk quite differently. Oh, where are my matches, dear? Top pocket, waistcoat. You were meaning to frighten me just now. No, I am just preparing you. Hmm. You see, darling, I can't call you dad when my hair is up. I think I shall call you parent. Oh. <laughs> Parent, dear, do you remember the days when your Margaret was a slip of a girl and sat on your knee? <laughs> How foolish we were, parent, in those distant days. Shut up, Margaret. Now I must be more distant to you. More like a boy who could not sit on your knee any more. Now look, see here. I want to go on painting. Shall I look now? I'm not quite sure whether I want you to. It makes such a difference. Perhaps you won't know me. <laughs> Even the pool is looking a little scared. What do you think? Will I do? Well, stand still, dear, and let me look my fill. Ah, the Margaret that is about to be. You'll see me often enough, Daddy, like this, so you don't need to look your fill. You are looking as long as if this were to be the only time. What was I? Well, surely it isn't to be that. <laughs> be gay, Dad. You will be sick of Margaret with her hair up before you are done with her. I expect so. Shut up, Daddy. <laughs> Daddy, I know what you are thinking. You are thinking what a handful she is going to be. Well, I guess she is. Uh, now you are thinking about... About my being in love someday. Rot! I won't, you know. <laughs> no, never. Oh, I have quite decided, so don't be afraid. Will you hate him at first, Daddy? Hmm? Daddy, hmm? will you hate him? Yeah. Will you hate him, Daddy? Uh, uh, whom? Well... If there was. If there was what, darling? Oh, you know the kind of thing I mean quite well. Would you hate him at first? I hope not. I should want to strangle him, but I wouldn't hate him. I would. That is to say, if I liked him. If you liked him, how could you hate him? For daring. Daring what? You know. But of course I shall have no say in the matter. You will do it all. You do everything for me. I can't help it. You will even write my love letters, if I ever have any to write. Which I won't. Oh, surely, to goodness, Margaret, I will leave you alone to do that. Not you. You will try to, but you won't be able. I, I want you, you, you see, to do everything exquisitely. I, I do wish I could leave you to do things a little more for yourself. I suppose it's owing to my having had to be father and mother both. I knew nothing practically about the bringing up of children, and of course... I couldn't trust you to a nurse. Not you. No. So sure you could do it better yourself. <laughs> that sort you all over. Daddy, do you remember how you taught me to balance a biscuit on my nose? Like a puppy? Did I? You called me Rover. I deny that. And when you said snap, I caught the biscuit in my mouth. Horrible. Daddy, I can do it still. Here is the last of my supper. Say snap, please. Not I. Say snap, please. I refuse. Daddy! Snap! <laughs> Let that be the last time, Margaret. Except just once more. I don't mean now, but when my hair is really up. If I should ever have a Margaret of my own, come in and see me, Daddy, in my white bed and say, Snap! And I'll have the biscuit ready. Right, oh. Dad, if I should ever marry, not that I will, but if I should... At the marriage ceremony, will you let me be the one who says I do? I suppose I deserve this. You think I'm pretty, don't you, Dad? Mm. Whatever other people say. Not so bad. I know I have nice ears. They're all right now, but I had to work on them for months. You don't mean to say that you did my ears. Rather. My dimple is my own. Well, I'm glad you think so. I wore up the point of my little finger over that dimple. Even my dimple? Mm. Have I anything that is really mine? A bit of my nose or anything? When you were a babe, you had a laugh that was all your own. Haven't I it now? It's gone. And I'll tell you how it went. We were fishing in a stream. Well, that is to say, I was wading, and you were sitting on my shoulders holding the rod. We didn't catch anything, and somehow or another, and I can't think how I did it, you irritated me, and I answered you sharply. I can't believe that. Yes, it sounds extraordinary, but I did. It gave you a shock, and from the moment the world no longer seemed a safe place to you. 
Your faith in me had always made it safe until then. You were suddenly not even sure of your bread and butter, and a frightened tear came to your eyes. I was in a nice state about it. <clears throat> I can tell you. Silly. But what has that got to do with my laugh, Daddy? The laugh that children are born with lasts just so long as they have perfect faith. And to think it was I who robbed you of yours. Oh, don't, dear. I'm sure the laugh just went off with the tear to comfort it. And they've been playing about in the stream ever since. They have quite forgotten us, so why should we remember them? Cheeky little beasts. Shall I tell you my father's back recollection? <laughs> I remember the first time I saw the stars. I have never in the night seen the night, and then I saw it and the stars together. Crack in my eye, Tommy. It isn't everyone who can boast of such a lovely, lovely recollection for their earliest, is it? I was determined your earliest should be a good one. Do you mean to say you planned it? Rather. Most people's earliest recollection is of some trivial thing, you know, how they cut their finger or lost a piece of string. I was resolved that my Margaret should be something bigger. I was poor, but I could give her the stars. Oh, how you love me, Daddy Kins. Yes, I do, rather. A vagrant woman wanders in their direction. Good evening. A good evening, Missy. Uh, evening, mister. You lost anything? Sometimes, when the tourists have had their sandwiches, there are bits left over. They squeeze them between the roots to keep the place tidy. Uh, I am looking for bits. You don't tell me you were as hungry as that. Try me. Daddy, that was my last biscuit. We must think of something else. Yes, wait a bit. We are sure to think of something. Daddy, think of something. Your father doesn't like you to touch the likes of me. Yes, he does. And if he doesn't, I'd do it all the same. This is a bit of myself, Daddy. That is all you know. You needn't be angry with her, mister. I'm all right. I'm not angry with her. I am very sorry for but you. If I had my rights, well, I would be as good as you and better. I dare say. I have had men servants and a motor car. Margaret and I never rose to that. I have been in a taxi several times, and Dad often gets telegrams. Margaret! I'm sorry, I boasted. That's nothing. I have had a townhouse. At least, I had. At any rate, he said there was a townhouse. Fancy his not knowing for certain. Mm. The Honourable Mrs Finch Fallow. That's who I am. It's a lovely name. Curse him. Don't you like him? We won't go into that. I have nothing to do with your past, but I wish we had some food to offer you. You haven't a flask? No, I don't take anything myself, but let me see. I know. You said we had five pounds. Would you like five pounds? Darling, don't be stupid. We haven't paid our bill at the inn. All right. I never asked you for anything. Don't take me up in that way. I have had my ups and downs myself. Here is ten bob. And, and I have half a crown. It is quite easy for us. Dad will be getting another fiver any day. You can't think how exciting it is when the fiver comes in and we dance and then we run out and buy chops. Margaret! It's kind of you. I'm richer this minute than I have been for many a day. It's nothing. I'm sure you would do the same for us. I wish I was so sure. Of course you would. Glad to have been any help. Get some victuals in as quickly as you can. Best of wishes, ma'am. May your luck change. Same to you. And may yours go on. Good night. What is her name, mister? Margaret. Margaret. Oh. You drew something good out of the lucky bag when you got her, mister. Yes. Take care of her. They are easily lost. Poor soul. I expect she has had a rough time and that some man is to blame for it. Partly, at any rate. That woman rather affects me, Margaret. I don't know why. Didn't you like her husky voice? I say, Margaret, we lucky ones. Let's swear always to be kind to people who are down on their luck. And then, when we are kind, let's be a little kinder. Yes, let's. Margaret, always feel sorry for the failures, the ones who are always failures, especially in my sort of calling. Wouldn't it be lovely to turn them on the 39th year of failure into glittering successes? <laughs> topping. Topping. Oh, topping. H how could we do it, Dad? By letter. <coughs> to poor old Tom Brokenheart, top attic, Garrett Chambers, S.E. <coughs> 
Dear sir, His Majesty has been graciously pleased to purchase your superb pitar of Molly Ferry. <laughs> P.S. I am sending the money in a sack so as you can hear it chink. <laughs> well, what could we do for our friend who passed just now? I, I can't get her out of my head. You have made me forget her. Dad, I didn't like it. Didn't like what, dear? I didn't like her saying that about your losing me. I shan't lose you. It would be hard for me if you lost me, but it would be worse for you. I don't know how I know that, but I do know it. What would you do without me? Don't talk like that, dear. It is wicked and stupid and naughty. Somehow that poor... I won't paint any more tonight. Let's get out of the wood. It frightens me. And you loved it a moment ago. Hello. I hadn't noticed there was a house there. Daddy, I feel sure there wasn't a house there. Ah, Goose, it's just that we didn't look. Our old way of letting the world go hang. So interested in ourselves. Nice behaviour for people who have been boasting about what they would do for other people. Now I see what I ought to do. Let's get out of the woods. Yes, but my idea first. It is to rouse these people and get food from them for the husky. She's too far away now. I can overtake her. Don't go into that house, Daddy. I don't know why it is, but I'm afraid of that house. There is a kiss for each moment until I come back. And I shall be back before you can count to one. Daddy, come back! I don't want to be a mite of bean!